Let us begin. I'd like to acknowledge that our original landholders, the Arapaho tribe, teach us the wisdom of being in place. I thank them for their ongoing lessons in sustainable life in our high desert and reminding us that it takes a village. This virtual town hall would not be possible without the support of our host, Empower Our Future and its stalwart advocacy of local power. We may not always agree on issues, but we will always agree to be civil. We support an energetic village commons, also known as the Empower Hour. Empower Our Future volunteers, Steve Whitaker, Julie Sonizer, Paul Coleman, and Leslie Glistrom are monitoring the mute buttons and tracking the questions requests coming in chat. This town hall owes everything to the efforts of Nina Krisman, Cooper Baum, Robin Noble, these legislative aides really brought this idea to life. We thank the tireless legislators themselves who have so graciously made time available to you after a long legislative planning day. And most of all, we thank you for taking time at the end of a long Zoom day to join us. Tonight, we have an hour of our legislators' evenings. Foremost, we are interested in hearing their outlooks for the current session of the General Assembly. In the time remaining, we will do our best to share your questions and concerns with to them. We will use the chat to field your feedback. If you have a question to pose, please tag it with question, 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 so our chat monitors can tell the questions from the commentary. Also, our two chat monitors will pr prioritize the questions asked by many people and combine related questions into one. Finally, your legislators are eager to hear your voices. And with the limited time, we have made a simple online form available should you not be heard this evening. We will place the link to the online form presently. And with that, we will introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Judy Amabel, who recently was elected to represent House District 13, which is the seat previously held by Speaker Casey Becker, who was term limited. House District 13 includes the western part of Boulder County, as well as Clear Creek, Gilpin, Grand, and Jackson County. Representative Amabel is a lifelong Democrat who has lived in Colorado for almost 50 years. She is a mother of three adult sons. For 25 years, she served as the founder and business owner of Polar Bottle, a maker of sport water bottles. As a legislator, she is working to fight climate change, bring greater economic justice to all Coloradans, and increase access to mental health resources in our state. Judy? Hi, thank you everybody for being here and thank you guys for putting this thing together and thank you to all the, to Robin and the other aides who um, helped out with that and to Leslie of course for everything she does. Um, so I think I'm supposed to talk about what bills I'm working on and I wanna just talk about one because I think it's the most important bill that I'm working on in this space. And what the, the bill is about rural electric co-ops. Colorado has 22 rural electric co-ops. Uh, these co-ops serve something like 30% um, of the consumers in Colorado. And right now they have sort of a patchwork of how they elect their boards. There's a lot of sort of cloak and dagger stuff. There's um, not a lot of transparency and there's not necessarily good governance. So the bill adds transparency, it uh, imposes some good governance on the co-ops, and it also applies to the to Tri-State, the co-op of which many of them are members. And um, it uh, makes sure that they disclose compensation, but mostly it makes it easier for new people to get elected to the board. And the reason that it matters is because these boards are deciding who is the president, who is the CEO of our co-op, what mix 
of electricity are we buying? How, what, how many renewables are we gonna support legislation at the state that allows more solar? How are we going to operate in the world as a co-op? And no other state has the kind of legislation that we're proposing, but they are all now looking to us so that they can do something similar in states all around the country that have co-ops. So it matters because right now we're all on the outside looking in, trying to pressure companies like Excel and Tri-State and others to change what they're doing. But these co-ops will be on the inside and that is a better place to be if you want to really make a difference in the mix of um, fuels that you're buying for your electricity. And so that's, that's, I think, the most consequential bill that I'm working on this session. And we've been stakeholding fast and furiously. And I think we have the bill in a pretty good place. We're about ready to finalize it. And anybody who wants to help get behind the bill, I would love your help as a uh, to come down to the Capitol and testify or write a letter in support, or if any of you live or are serviced by a rural electric co-op, to write to your co-op board and tell them you would like them to support this bill. So thank you. Okay, and next up we have Steve Fenberg with ED on Deck. Steve Fenberg was elected to the Colorado Senate in 2016 and has served as a Senate Majority Leader since 2018. Majority Leader Fenberg prioritizes increasing voting access, bold solutions to the climate crisis, and structural reforms to advance economic and social justice. In 2019, he sponsored and passed the largest overhaul of oil and gas regulations in Colorado in over 60 years, and he continues to be a champion of climate and energy legislation. He also just got a recent important promotion to father. Steve? Thank you, David, um, and good to see all of you. Thanks for putting this together. Uh, awesome crowd, almost 200 people now, so I um, appreciate it. Um, you know, we have obviously uh, done a lot as a state when it comes to climate and energy issues just in the last couple of years. Um, but we all know it's, it's nowhere near what we need to be doing to solve the, the massive um, crisis that's, that's uh, in front of us right now. So, um, you know, that is to say, we, we should take a brief moment to remember what we, what we have already accomplished and um, use that as inspiration to keep on going to, to make sure we 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 don't stop there, and we don't um, we don't be we don't get satisfied with with the work that we have done because there's so much more to do. Um, you know, I, I will just say real quick. Obviously, we are living in a time where we have a we have it seems like we have a crisis on top of a crisis. Um, you know, I, if if you're in front of your TV at all today, you were watching the impeachment trial of our most recent president, while we have this climate crisis going on in the background. Um, while we also have a global pandemic that has quickly uh, resulted into an economic crisis. So there's a lot um, that uh, elected officials and leaders and community leaders have on their minds and, and on their to-do list in the near future. Um, and what I would say is, you know, in some ways, I think some people would look at that and say, okay, climate and environmental stuff and things like that can be on the back burner. Um, because we have all these other issues that are facing us that are so urgent. And what I would say is I, I think that is tempting um, uh, for some people to think that way. Um, but in a lot of ways, I think the crises that are in front of us actually give us a massive opportunity um, to, to rethink and reimagine what, uh, what we want our society to look like and what we want to value and what equity truly looks like in our economic system and all of that. And so um, clearly our number one priority in the very short term, this legislative session, which starts Tuesday, um, we actually already started a month ago, but our grand opening is Tuesday. Uh, we took a month off because of, because of the virus. Um, our number one uh, priority is, is going to be getting Colorado um, in, in a place where we can, we can address the immediate health crisis that's in front of us. 
Um, and it's obviously turned into an economic crisis and we need to address that. And those are gonna be um, big priorities for us right out of the gate come Tuesday. But um, you know, the way I think about it is we need to stop the bleeding we need to stop the crisis that's in front of us. We need to get people in our society back to where we were pre-pandemic. Um, but probably most importantly, we need to think about how we're building our future so that we can be more resilient and more equitable um, for the next pandemic and for the current crises that are already facing us like climate. Um, and, and that's where I think it's really exciting. And there's a lot we can do on energy and climate. Um, and so, you know, a couple of the bills that I'm gonna be working on, um, just to name a few, and then we can get into more details. Uh, one that I'm excited about is building electrification. So essentially um, tackling the, you know, the, that part of our economy that we haven't made tons of progress on yet when it comes to how we heat our homes and our water, um, which are largely reliant right now on natural gas um, and providing uh, incentives essentially to ensure buildings, whether it's residential or commercial, are switching from natural gas um, as much as possible over to, uh, to electric, um, things like high efficiency heat pumps and things like that. Um, the, another aspect that has been one of those hard to, hard to make much progress on on the climate front is transportation. And um, we're very hopeful that we're gonna have a large transportation deal um, come out of this legislative session. And we all know the transportation sector is, is something that pollutes and is very much uh, um, a big part of our climate problem. Um, and so we're gonna prioritize and focus on multimodal transit um, investments as well as electrification, um, knowing that the future of transportation in just a, a, a hopefully a few short years is gonna look very different than the one a few short years ago. And we need to electrify and get ready for that transition very fast. Um, we're gonna hopefully make some down payments on the, on the just transition uh, work that we wanna do as a state for communities and for workers that are historically reliant on fossil fuel production um, and make sure we're doing right by them. Um, we uh, are absolutely gonna focus on wildfire mitigation um, unfortunately, we also have to focus on wildfire response, um, and that will look like literally purchase, purchasing helicopters and things like that. Um, but we need to think about long-term mitigation, forest health, et cetera, um, to, to blunt the impacts of the future. Um, we uh, also, I, I'm going to be working on a bill um, around the 120% cap um, that I think folks are, are familiar with, but essentially the the relatively arbitrary cap on uh, rooftop solar right now. And that was part of the uh, negotiations between Excel and the city of Boulder. Um, so I wanna make sure we are getting that done and doing it in a way that moves the ball forward in a significant and hopefully pretty fast way for um, uh, encouraging more solar. Um, and then uh, there's also gonna be some other big picture reforms that we'll focus on. Um, I'm gonna probably have a bill with Senator Chris Hansen around PUC reform. Um, something we've been looking at in the past. And we actually made some big strides in the last couple of years, um, like adding the um, cost of carbon into uh, calculations for future resource plans and distribution system planning and things like that. We took care of that a few years ago. There's a few other things we still wanna do, especially on the side of trans, uh, transmission, um, kind of one of the missing pieces uh, to, to um, getting uh, a lot more renewables online fast, especially in areas that are traditionally um, uh, underrepresented and don't have a lot of economic opportunities. Um, so uh, that will be in the form of, Chris has a bill around RTOs, um, and then we also have a separate bill around some structural reforms in the PUC world, which most of the time when I talk about that, people fall asleep in front of me, but I know this crowd is uh, nerdy enough to, to be excited about the, the letters PUC. Um, uh, so, um, so we'll be talking more about that in the future as well, but there's just a, a handful of the things we're also going to be working on environmental justice and ensuring that, um, we are providing, um, uh, we're, we're thinking with an equity lens when we do all of our investments in renewables, if we're going to be investing in electric buses, I think we should focus on underrepresented communities that are more reliant on transit and have a historically, um, uh, disproportionate impact from air quality issues, for instance. So equity is gonna be part of the, the narrative and part of the, the objective and pretty much everything we take on in the energy front this, um, this session. Um, I'll leave it there um, and looking forward to, to chatting more and, and having more um, uh, answering some of your questions. Okay, we're gonna move on to 
Representative Edie Hooten serves as the state representative for Colorado House Dis District 10, representing Boulder, constituents east of Broadway, south of Bro Baseline and into Gun Barrel. In her fifth year representing Colorado House District 10, Representative Hooten serves as the chair of the Capital Development Committee, vice chair of the House Energy and Environment Committee, and is also a member of the House Transportation and Local Government Committee. Representative Hooten's legislative priorities include taking bold action against climate change, preventing youth homelessness, increasing transparency in our healthcare system, and ensuring that housing is a human right for all. I have run into Edie at many weekend programs. She stays late. And she explains, of course, these explains, are my, of course, these are my, uh, Edie. Thank you, David, um, for that generous introduction and for everyone on the call. And of course, to Leslie and uh, Empower Our Future uh, for hosting this event and uh, just true to form Boulder, uh, hugely participates on issues around environment and energy. And I will tell you, energy uh, is rising in Colorado and at the legislature. And so I think finally, uh, we're out from the um, fringes, uh, trying to have our voices heard uh, to being the epicenter and being considered the leaders and everyone's looking to us for answers to this incredibly dire climate um, emergency that we are facing. Uh, while we're waiting for Representative Hooten to come back, I think I'm gonna jump in and ask Senator Fenberg if he'd be willing to talk a little bit more, maybe he can't yet because it's not settled, but a lot of people in Boulder are really interested in the 120%, what, what we often refer to as the 120% bill. And just to use our time, hopefully constructively. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about what that is and how you're thinking about it. Um, it, it just to kind of, while we're getting Representative Hooten back in or, order here. Sure. Thank yeah, you. So, yeah, for folks um, who aren't as up to speed on this issue, basically right now, um, state law, and this has been on the books for a while, it's not, it's not necessarily um, a utility require. I mean, the utilities um, we're part of the conversation that put this into the law, but it's it's enshrined in law, so they don't really have much of a choice right now. And what it is is that basically, um, if you want to inter interconnect a, a net metered uh, rooftop solar system, like on on your home, um, you can only do you can only install um, enough panels, a, a big enough uh, system that is of that is 120% of your previous year's average annual usage. So um, essentially, they don't want you installing a solar system on your roof that is much that produces much more energy than what you would use. Um, so they give you a 20% buffer. There is a process um, down the road that if you increase your your electricity usage, you can increase it. Um, you could add panels. You can um, you can get a bit of a waiver, I think, if you're purchasing an electric vehicle and things like that. But um, generally speaking, you're limited to 120%. This bill. Um, is still being worked on uh, and stakeholdered and, and we're talking to utilities and advocates and others. Um, but essentially it would it would lift that um, uh, that limit. So it would either lift it or you know entirely or it would raise it quite a bit. Um, and the idea is it's, it's a little silly in this day and age when we're trying to get more renewables and you know meet these very aggressive climate goals. Uh, to say, you know, if you have a big roof and, and you could put more solar on it, we're not going to allow you by the force of law to do so. Um, we probably should be saying, if you've got roof uh, space and you're willing to do it and you're gonna be part of the solution, we should figure out a way for that to make sense for you as a consumer to put more rooftop solar um, on your house. So the big question really is going to be, are there going to be other limits, right? So if you can install a larger system on your roof, the utilities, frankly, um, are gonna wanna limit how much they have to pay you for that energy you're producing because they're, they're in the business of selling you energy. They don't really want you providing more energy that they have to buy from you. <laughs> it's kind of the reverse of how it's supposed to work for them. 
So uh, they are going to push and say that they want to limit how much they have to purchase or how much the consumer is allowed to roll over from month to month on their, on their bill um, and things like that. And that's the crux of it. That's where the debate is and the conversation. We want to make sure we're doing this in a way that, that results in more solar, more um, uh, uh, solar being used to, to sort of power uh, people's homes locally. So we don't have to burn coal in a coal plant miles and miles away and send it over transmission lines and lose some of the energy and, and all of that kind of thing. If we can produce more energy on our rooftop that we use and our neighbors would use it if it's excess, um, we think that's uh, much much better for the environment as well as for the consumer actually. Um, so it's gonna be a give and take and, and I think we'll get somewhere cool um, and, and interesting with it that will result in more solar, hopefully it does it in a way that doesn't um, doesn't Im negatively impact current net metering laws because that's a touchy subject for folks. Um, and, and it's exciting to go down this path and have the conversation of what the future could look like with more solar and more distribution, um, distributed uh, generation out there because that's when you open the door, much more interested in things like demand response and using your electric vehicle to be a battery backup for your home or for the grid. And you know we can get into more interesting things like that when you open up the door to more generation and break down some of these barriers. Um, I think Edie's back as Cooper, uh, um, but we'll, we'll let it slide. Cooper looks different today. <laughs> pass it back over to Edie. I, know. I don't know how this works. Um, can you hear me now? Perfect. Yes. Okay, great. So um, thank you. I got a lot of uh, personal messages in the chat about what I should do and uh, including my husband texting me like mad. <laughs> so, um, and thank you, honey, for being on the call. Um, so uh, I was thanking everyone and I thank you very much. And I'm really glad to be here. Uh, I think I did just say that uh, energy is rising um, as an issue with the capital. And that's a very good thing. Um, I am bringing back my community choice energy study bill. And I think most of you on the call are familiar with it, but I will give you a brief uh, recap. So what this would do, uh, the bill would um, open up a PUC docket or docket at the PUC to investigate how community choice aggregation might work in Colorado. Now I refer to it as community choice energy because I believe that is more intuitive but it's exactly the same thing as community choice aggregation. And what this would provide is an opportunity for communities that are served by investor owned um, utilities to procure their own uh, electricity. And uh, for those communities in Colorado, whether they are uh, seeking lower rates or 100% uh, renewable electricity, options for both. It's a market-based approach. Um, and so that is what we seek to explore. The utility continues to own its infrastructure, the billing, the customer service, the demand side management, that all stays with the utility. This is not a competitive relationship, it is a cooperative relationship. Um, the timeline, so I, the bill was introduced last year. It passed out of the Energy and Environment Committee, and then it landed in the Appropriations Committee, uh, and then COVID hit, and like many other bills, uh, had to be withdrawn to make way for COVID emergency relief legislation. So I have brought it back this year, and uh, new and improved, uh, we've got an improved fiscal note, uh, which is it's always in consideration and uh, certainly in these uh, challenging budget times, uh, even more so. So it's a, it's a favorable fiscal note and actually Steve can speak to this. He's running a bill that um, will improve uh, the funding for PUC uh, investigations and uh, where those resources are drawn from. Anyway, uh, since last session and going into this session, this is my first bill. And um, I've got considerable support. 
Uh, we've got um, Boulder City and Council, the City Council and our County Commissioners, Lafayette, Golden, Pueblo, San Miguel County, uh, uh, the City of Denver, Denver City Council have all unanimously passed resolutions in favor of the study bill. And uh, there are 21 well-considered questions that the PUC would look at. And it is a very, uh, for any of you who are familiar with the uh, Public Utilities Commission, it's a very transparent process. So everyone who has a stake or an interest uh, has the opportunity to weigh in. Um, if the bill passes this session, uh, then it would go into uh, the PUC docket. That would be a seven or eight, nine month process. They would provide a report to the legislature, to the chairs of the energy committees in both chambers. And if we thought the findings of the report were favorable, then I would introduce enabling legislation. Uh, if I was successful in doing that, um, that would pass. And we're talking now 2023. And, uh, and then it goes into the rulemaking process. And after the rulemaking process is complete, we're now in uh, 2024, late 2024. And so 2025, would probably be the first year that communities like Boulder or Pueblo um, or Denver, Golden uh, could seriously consider uh, pursuing a community choice energy model for their own communities. And uh, this dovetails quite nicely with Xcel Energy's um, uh, goals for that were you know mandated by 1426 and with Excel's and Boulder's franchise agreement. So our first off-ramp in our franchise agreement would be 2025. And so this is um, a very interesting confluence of timing um, on the ultimate, if it came to that, uh, consideration by Boulder for adopting a community choice energy model for Excel meeting its um, uh, commitments, its obligation, not obligations, because they're not obligated, they're just committing to it, they've agreed to it in 2025. Uh, it does put some pressure on the whole process. And I think that's quite valuable. And it also uh, raises awareness that communities served uh, by investor owned utilities have options or possibly could have options. So we've got a lot of support. The governor, Governor Polis supports the bill. Uh, we've got some very active, uh, the Colorado Municipal League, uh, whose mission is, is to advocate for local control uh, is taking leadership on this bill. They very much support it as does the Sierra Club and Sierra Club has been a great partner from the very beginning on the bill. And we've got um, the uh, Communities for Climate Action are supporting. We've got some very great partners and uh, a lot of momentum, but as you can imagine, we do have some resistance. So, um, and therein lies the rub, you know, how we get everyone on board to support a study bill. This is not enabling legislation, but you know, it it's it threatens, you know, some interest. And so it's my first bill and it's will be my biggest lift this session. <laughs> and I thank everyone on this call who is interested in supporting me in my effort. And I know that Empower Our Future has been. Uh, taking a leadership role, and I appreciate that very much, and happy to answer anyone. Woo. Okay, so we're going to head into um, question and answer. The way we're going to handle this is we've had two, two of our volunteers um, monitoring the chat. We're going to go with um, Julie Zanheiser first. Uh, go ahead and unmute and unvideo her and yeah. 
Okay, thank you so much. We really appreciate the three of you taking this kind of time and your little your introductions, although they were not as lengthy as you or we would like, uh, gave us a good good start. This is a question that came in from uh, it's a combination question from a couple of different people on a topic that really wasn't mentioned, and that relates to. Um, some of last year's legislation and, and some hopes for going forward. It relates to last year's House Bill 1261, which uh, directed Excel to be 80%, um, to have 80% carbon reduction. I believe it, this is what the questioner is saying by 2030, but they feel there are two questions about that. One, does the air quality board uh, have an impact on whether they will achieve that goal and um, are there firm rules and what if Excel doesn't achieve this goal and is there a cost for non-compliance and and then thirdly some individuals feel that that's not fast enough and what can we do about that so I I'll, I'll jump into to start um, we could probably talk about this topic for the rest of the night and then some, uh, but um, 1261 was a, was a, a big um, uh, accomplishment uh, for Colorado. It, it did actually set those uh, climate and those emission reduction goals, not just for Excel, um, but for the entire state. Um, uh, so, so that technically applies to um, transportation sector. It applies to the utilities. It applies to, um, to oil and gas. It applies to the entire economy of Colorado. Um, in a lot of ways. So that's that's why it's so great. That's also why it's so incredibly difficult to implement <laughs> because it's not just one specific sector. There were other bills, especially that year, like Senate Bill 236, which was my bill, that actually includes some of the more specifics um, related to Excel and for utilities. And, and both of those bills really kind of live together to accomplish the, those goals. The, the interesting thing about the AQCC, so that's the Air Quality Control Commission. There's a lot of acronyms in this, in this world. Um, uh, they are largely the entity that is implementing 1261, um, but it is, uh, but Excel, generally speaking, their regulator is the PUC, the Public Utilities Commission. So right there, that what I just said, it sort of illustrates some of the complexities here, right? The, the implementer of 1261 is the AQCC, but Excel, which is um, you know a, a, the the largest utility, one of the largest emitters of emissions, um, is regulated at the PUC, and that's why you got to sort of look at 1261 and, and Senate Bill 236 uh, together to understand how to implement some of this stuff. Um, do I think we're moving fast enough? No, I don't. Um, I don't. I, th I think Judy and Edie would agree um, that um, we that's not necessarily to point fingers or to blame anyone. That's to say that no matter how fast we are acting, it will probably never be fast enough in my mind because um, we, we needed to have acted more aggressively decades ago. Um, but, you know, I, I think we got a slow start in some meeting some of these goals. I actually think it's, you know, it's going to accelerate and we're going to hit, um, we're, we're going to start doing things that are going to make significant bites at the apple these next couple of years. I think tackling the transportation system and electrifying is as much as we possibly can when it comes to transportation is going to be a, a, a is going to have a huge impact. Um, the the um, Excel is uh, just about to file their electric resource plan and that is going to tell us a lot more about where they think they are headed and where they're capable of going in the next several years. Um, you know, Colorado Springs shut down is shutting down their their uh, uh, coal plant. So things are happening. They're happening pretty fast. I think we, uh, as as advocates, need to be ready. I, I know we've all been waiting for this transition for a generation now, but we need to be ready to make sure it happens uh, correctly. It happens in a way that is good for the consumer, not just the climate, and also good for workers and keeps um, communities in mind when these coal plants and when these fossil fuel um, uh, uh, economies really do transition. So um, there's a lot we still need to do. Um, the roadmap, the greenhouse gas roadmap that the governor put out recently um, is, is great. It's not enough. I think we all agree, um, but, but it is at least um, uh, a roadmap, right? It is the, the major stepping stones that we have to take 
and we all have to push ourselves as well as the governor, as well as the utilities and all the other people and entities in this in this conversation to move faster than even what the law requires them. Thank you a lot. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Okay, we'll now go to Steve Whitaker for the next round. Julie, yes, on one, we have a question yet again for uh, Steve Fenberg. Uh, the question being, will the building electrification bill include bans or disincentives for new natural gas infrastructure, which will have a 50 plus amortization period? Uh, you know, I, I'll be, um, I'm not going to be the typical politician and I'm going to be really direct on this one. Probably not. It, it's probably not going to have an, an outright ban on installing um, natural gas to, to homes uh, for, for a few reasons. One of which is that I'm not sure that the bill would pass if that was in it. Mm. And if this is really about um, transitioning uh, uh, folks' homes, home heating over to um, to electricity and heat pumps and electric water heaters, et cetera, as fast as possible. Um, I want to make sure the bill passes, <laughs> first of all. And, and then secondly, um, this is going to be really about um, uh, moving the market as fast as we can. And obviously an outright ban on new construction would move that part of the market pretty quick. Um, but um, I, I think it's probably more, it's faster to get this done um, by thinking about all of the buildings that have already been built, which is the problem right now, right? Rather than having a fight about future builds um, when we, we aren't even doing enough right now to retrofit homes. So is this something that I would support? Um, yes. Uh, it, it's something that we need to do? Yes. Um, I, I think there's also an issue where you know the 188 of us on this call would say, yeah, hell yeah, get rid of the natural gas that's going to every home and building, um, a lot of people still like cooking on their natural gas stove. And um, we need, you know, we, we don't wanna pick a fight with, with the, the average homeowner um, when this bill really is a bill that's gonna help the average homeowner. And we don't wanna confuse that message. So there's a further debate to have there. There's a further um, policy uh, discussion, um, but, but I think, you know, my goal, we didn't get this done last year because of COVID. So we're already a year behind. My goal is to do whatever we can as fast as possible to get um, hopefully millions of dollars every year into um, homeowners' hands to buy heat pumps and electric water heaters and things like that. We have um, a couple questions that relate to general resilience and um, it might be something uh, that Perhaps uh, Representative Amable has answer, has thoughts on as well as uh, our other two guests. Um, just this person wanted to know about governance models and distributed systems that communities could possibly adopt um, that might incorporate uh, agriculture. That's one aspect. And the other idea is uh, the concept of um, Zero, striving for zero waste being a quick and easy way to fight climate change. I, I think that is probably not what they meant as quick and easy, but is an important thing to consider. And so I uh, just wonder if you have any comments about some other aspects of resilience that might relate to how our systems are set up. Well, I'll, I'll just be very brief because I'm not as knowledgeable as Stephen Eady about the legislation and all of that. But um, first I wanna make a comment about people wanting their gas stoves. And that is true and I have a gas stove and I like it, but people also used to like to burn wood in their fireplace. And nobody likes to do that anymore because it's super polluting, because it's a pain in the neck. And so um, we can adjust, but I do think you have to give people space to adjust. And um, that, <laughs> resiliency is enhanced when you bring people along by making it good for them rather than to make it feel like it's punishment for them or it hurts them. So I totally agree with Steve that th these are gradual processes. And when I think about resiliency, it's about what are we doing right now 
to make sure that the climate crisis, which is upon us, doesn't defeat us. So we really have to turn some attention to the forest fires, to the flooding, to the drought, and all those things and figure out, we have to tackle water in our state uh, because these things are already here and we've got to make sure that they, we address them in a way that's proactive. So take it away, Steve. Um, we haven't talked about fracking today. And um, is there any, uh, it, what do you ha three have to say about stopping fracking? Um, so I, I guess I'll say a few things. I mean, um, obviously we passed Senate Bill 181. Uh, it, it, I think it was said in the intro, it was the, the biggest reforms to oil and gas in 60 years. Um, it was also kind of like the only <laughs> reform um, uh, in oil and gas in 60 years. There are obviously some things, but it largely is the only um, uh, big movement forward that we've made on, on regulating and, and reforming the oil and gas industry in Colorado. So we, there, you know, I think we often actually do forget how much that bill did tackle um, because it did so much all at once. Um, it was just about every other oil and gas bill introduced uh, in one way or another wrapped up into one bill. It obviously didn't end fracking. It didn't um, do everything that folks uh, would want is fast enough. Um, but I, I would say the vast majority of what it was intended to do is, is happening or is in, in process. Um, the Oil and Gas Commission has been overhauled and um, they're, you know, they're still in the middle of some of their rulemakings, um, but a lot of the rulemakings have uh, are, are either been completed or near completion. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's sort of hard right now. Obviously, there's a lot of pressures on the oil and gas industry that has changed sort of how it, what it looks like. Um, you know, I, the, the, in some ways, um, it, it's one of those areas where mergers and acquisitions normally isn't something I, I cheerlead. Um, but uh, it does seem like we are in the next couple of years, we're going to basically have a couple of natural of, of frackers of oil and gas um, extractors that most of the small companies are sort of merging or getting bought up by the big guys. Even the big guys in Colorado have been bought up by the big international guys. And, you know, I'm not saying that's inherently good or that's going to solve our problem. But I do think it, it's going, I, I, I think it, the Wild West days of Colorado fracking are going to be over, if not yet, but they will be very, very soon. And I think that actually is probably means that it's going to be easier for us to get the handle on where regulations are lax, where they need to be um, upgraded um, and, you know, set standards that large corporations can, can meet. So I guess what I'm saying is, um, did, did 181 and are there bills uh, in, in process that is going to totally end oil and gas extraction once and for all in Colorado? No. Um, uh, you know, that frankly wasn't the intention of what 181 was supposed to accomplish. Um, I think there will be further fights, further conversations, further debates around uh, the future of oil and gas. I think, as many people have said in the chat, the problem is not, not just making sure we stop using natural gas. It's the fact that there's a market for it outside of our, our, um, the border of our state. And so, you know, in some ways that's going to only change when Congress and the federal government does more and takes it on more. And I'm hopeful that we will very soon. Um, but that's part of it. We have to address the, the demand that is outside of our borders. Um, oil and the companies have not been drilling much lately because they can't sell it. Um, and that's largely because of the international economic conditions and things happening in the Middle East, um, et cetera. But, you know, it's, it's almost like it's end fracking. We need to recreate that market system. Um, but because uh, of national policies that have been passed um, to make it the case. So that's obviously not all of it. There's more we need to do to protect the communities, protect air quality. There's a whole lot more investment we need to do um, in, uh, in protecting um, people from the harmful uh, uh, air you know, impacts of oil and gas. And we got started on some of that last year, but there's a whole lot more to do. And I know there's a lot of people on this call that are 
more experts than I am on that topic. Edie? Okay, you let's see how we're doing here. Can you hear me now? All right, good. So apparently I just need to periodically log out and log back in. Uh, what I'd like to do is just sort of finish my thoughts around uh, electrifying the building and transportation sectors, which I think is critically important. I mean, everything that we can do, um, it, it all, all of it comes together to reduce carbon. Uh, in our atmosphere. But I would like to just emphasize that um, if we're not decarbonizing the electric grid that feeds building electrification and feeds electrifying transportation, then we're really not making a lot of progress. And so um, that is something I just want to emphasize. And that is really the, t the tail that's wagging the dog is um, efforts to, you know, nibble around and gosh, this is not any kind of criticism towards Steve or anyone who is, uh, you know, working hard to encourage electrification of other sectors, but um, the source, we're talking about electricity. And if we're not decarbonizing electricity quickly, um, how much progress are we actually going to make uh, through building electrification and transportation electrification? I just wanted to raise that. Oh, Steve, you're on. Yes, I have a question here that uh, is asked the question, will the building electrification and EV bills require utilities to stop dumping surplus wind and solar by supporting time of renewable programs. Excel tosses, curtails wind that we pay for. Excel expects $39 million of waste curtailed wind in 2021. So the, the electrification bill is not gonna address that issue in, in um, particular, but um, uh, some there will be other bills that I think get at it in one way. And so, for instance, if there's more, um, if we have a regional transmission um, organization, if we, you know, move forward in that way, I think that actually does help um, quite a bit because if there's a, another, you know, more options of where to send that energy, um, hopefully it won't go to, to waste. Um, the other thing is, you know, there needs to be a, a much bigger investment um, in storage. Uh, you know, th that has to be part of the equation. I think there were, I was just reading, there were some questions around, can we even handle 100% renewables? Um, the answer is absolutely yes, if we are smart about it and we think about w when and how uh, we can do storage and when we can do demand response programs, um, uh, where like I was saying at the beginning of the talk, you know, uh, the, the utility can sort of control when you discharge your battery and when you charge your battery based on excess, you know, energy on the grid. So there's a lot we can do. Um, some states are already doing a lot of this. Um, the, the problem is, and this really isn't a, 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 a dig at Excel or the other utilities, it's, it's not necessarily in their interest to do so. Right, their their interests are stakeholders and and building things and selling us energy, not necessarily helping us manage our energy use within our own homes. And so, I think we need to figure out from a policy perspective how we make it more in the utilities' interest um, to explore uh, more electrification, to explore more demand response, to want everybody to get batteries, because in the end, it does provide a service to the electricity grid. And once we have a more complex grid in that way, um, then energy won't be going to use. And then we won't have surplus solar in the day that we don't know what to do with because people don't use their most of their energy until their evenings when they come home. So those are, it seems crazy that we're still having this problem in this day and age without how much technology runs everything in the world in our lives. Um, the technology is there. We just need to figure out a market incentive or a policy that um, deploys it soon so that it can, it can be put to use in our grid. Uh, 
what about a bill to end cold fire power by 2025, uh, which we the, this person had heard was possibly being considered. And in conjunction with that, can that be done with a just transition and leading on to added onto that, what does a fair and just transition mean to you? So anybody could take that. Well, just and Steve, you can we can just speak in concert. I mean, actually, uh, can you hear me? How is my audio? It's good right now. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's see how far that goes. Um, so, with respect to just transition, of course, that's extremely important. Uh, the energy sector in Colorado has employed thousands of Coloradans. And so the transition to renewables uh, is a real thing. And the governor established an office for uh, just transition, you know, for the employees in the extractive energy industry. And, uh, but it hasn't been funded. And so we're actually looking uh, at several ways that we might be able to fund that office. Um, one of them, and I don't know the details, it's a little bit obscure, Steve, maybe you know a little bit more about this, but Pinnacle Assurance, we are negotiating out of Pinnacle Assurance and the um, it will be a, a net benefit financially for us. And so there is a consideration of creating a trust fund uh, in the Office of Just Transition using those uh, proceeds from uh, the transition away from Pinnacle. Uh, and there is another idea that I have and, and I haven't advanced it too far, but I think you know we all know that the extractive industries um, receive some pretty generous tax credits from uh, the state of Colorado. And even if we just took a half a percent of those tax credits or whatever percent um, and use those savings to fund the just transition, uh, we would probably have uh, a lot of funding for a robust program. And what was the second part of the question? Or the first part? The other part was uh, in support of shutting down coal plants faster and can that be done in a in, in a just way? Well, you know, the, the um, utilities that own, own the coal plants uh, negotiate with XL Energy, I mean, with the PUC on um, when they're going to decommission their plants. Uh, we do have um, targets in, through House Bill 1261, um, and the first target is in 2025. So there is consideration of running legislation. I don't know if it's gonna happen this year, not because of will, but because of capacity, um, a bill that would uh, require that um, the reissuance of permits uh, that keep coal plants operating uh, would not uh, exceed the uh, the goals that have already been set for 2025. So we're in discussion. I've been talking to people about that. I don't know if that's something that we can run this year, but I think that um, would be an extra incentive. And it's absolutely um, legitimate if we're gonna meet that 2025 target, that first target, um, then there's no reason to issue permits that um, would extend, like if a permit is renewed three years from now, that extends for 10 years, then that could be construed as a takings, right? Uh, so we need to be very thoughtful about how we um, reissue permits and make sure that they coincide with the goals that were set out in House Bill 1261. Steve? I'd like to make a comment on this one. Um, so you asked, what do you think a just transition really means? And yes, we have to fund the Office of Just Transition, but that was pretty narrowly focused on coal 
and on you know sort of retraining but really the just transition piece has to be embedded in everything we do going forward because we have communities all over Colorado that have been the victims of this boom and bust cycle of the extraction industries and those communities are devastated by the bus cycles because they, you know, they build up during the boom cycles. And the people in those communities are left broken, broke, lonely, filled with despair. Those are the people who are committing suicide in record numbers. And so it really has to be a bigger conversation about how do we bring economic diversity to the whole state. So especially in the rural parts of the state and I represent a larger community than just Boulder. I have my, you know, I go all the way up to Jackson where they're heavily reliant on fracking and oil and gas. And that has to stop and they know it, but they're desperate. And the fastest way to bring people along and to make the transition just and fast is to bring alternative economic opportunity to those places. And um, I don't think we're really looking at it quite in the right way yet. It's got to be a pretty broad uh, look. And one of the things that brings economic opportunity to communities is a community college, for one thing. I mean, there's just one example. So in Grand County, they wanted a community college, and they, they couldn't make it happen. But that would have brought a whole lot of economic development just in and of itself. And then that economic development would have brought more economic development. And that would have been a, a, you know, a really good thing. So that's the kind of big picture thinking I think we have to do. And then I would just say about the, um, the workers comp and pinnacle assurance. Um, I would say there's some fairly large pitfalls in that one. And um, that's a I, I just so happened to have met with workers comp today and they were not excited about Pinnacle's offer. And um, so I think I'm getting a real hit of how complicated it, it all is and how interconnected everything is. But I think I'm not sure that's gonna um, be the magic bullet. Maybe it will be, but I don't know. Thank you both. Um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just say Ju Judy's spot on on a lot of that. I mean, it. it I think it's really, it, it seems like there's, there like, what the hell is going on? Why, are, why aren't we just moving faster? If you look at it strictly as, well, this shutting down this coal plant would mean 120 people no longer have a job. That problem in and of itself, I don't want to minimize it in the work that um, uh, those workers do. But if that was the policy problem, th there are solutions there but it's much bigger and broader. And it's about the worth of a community and its soul and sort of what it's been doing for generations. And when you take a big asset like a coal plant and you, know, you can replace that with another example, if you take it offline, all of a sudden there's no tax base. And some of these, some communities are entirely reliant. Like they're literally their county government budget is entirely reliant on the tax uh, taxes that come in from oil and gas or from, from a coal plant or, or a coal mine. And that's not a reason to just do it forever, but it means that it can't just be about retraining a hundred workers. It has to be about figuring out how to make that community uh, a little bit more whole than, than just simply you know giving a hundred people a job. Um, and that's complex and that's big. And, and that's what just transition has to be about. That's, that's where equity comes in. And, and we can't we can't ignore it. We also can't use that as a crutch and a reason to not do something. Um, and if anything, it, it, again, it's like it creates a big opportunity for some of these communities um, and for us as policymakers to, to think about how to direct resources and assistance uh, to them so that they can recreate themselves on their own terms. So we're on the hour, legislators. Do we have time for one more? Sure. One more, Steve, uh -huh. you're up. Yes, uh, I'm gonna paraphrase this question. It's directed to uh, Senator Fenberg and uh, to the, the sense of it is that Boulder County might pass a 
fracking ban, but I'm in Erie and split counties and we have more fracking coming. So how can we get cities and counties to pass these things if we are still fracking, which 85% is shipped out of state? Uh, is that question about the natural gas, in, like like natural gas going to homes ban or, or like a fracking extraction ban? I would, I, I would assume that it's the fracking uh, ban, ban on fracking within the counties. So um, 181, it was not perfect <laughs> by any means, but what it attempted to do uh, was uh, to, to set a new floor of basic standards. So where there was going to continue to be fracking, that there would be um, new standards and uh, not every permit would get approved and there would be, and we just, just recently, the commission adopted um, uh, setbacks. They're not, they're not hard set in stone setbacks, but they're, it's, it's major progress. Um, and I think it's 2000 feet. Um, and, and so, you know, the first step was to say, if, there's gonna be fracking in some places. Like, it's not like everybody's gonna be like Boulder, like, like this, whoever asked this question lives in Erie. It's a little different. And so um, it's not gonna just, not every city is just gonna say no um, or to put their own regulations in place right away. So that's why we wrote 181 to at least have those baseline standards. If you live in Weld County um, and your county and your community supports the oil and gas industry as an economic um, development uh, you know, part of your strategy, uh, that doesn't mean you should suffer because it's simply a, you live down the street uh, and you're in Weld County. You should still have basic human rights uh, and make sure that you're not being, um, you know, used as a sacrifice zone. And that's what the the 181 baseline standards are meant to do. But then, as as we all know, it also provided a, a level of local control. So for some communities, you're going to say what the state does isn't good enough. We want to take it into our own hands and have a say over when, where, how, and if oil and gas extraction is going to happen in our backyards. And so that's what we were trying to do with 181 was to sort of create some, some guardrails to say, you know, communities have, have the, the final say now. And for communities to say, yes, let's do it. It doesn't mean you do whatever the hell you want and poison people or not don't have safety standards. It means that those communities now have to follow in uh, more stringent state regulations. So does that mean that um, you, basically that means that wherever you live, there should be some baseline standards and um, you may even have live in a place now where your city or your county government has a whole lot more say over how extraction occurs. Um, it's not perfect, uh, but it is, I think, um, light years ahead of where we were for a long time and how we treated oil and gas and basically allowed every permit that came to the commission. And the goal of the commission was to promote the industry rather than regulate it. Um, so I don't know if that totally answers the question. I, I think. It means that there are a lot more tools for communities um, and also a lot more avenues for people to, to voice concerns when especially neighborhood drilling is proposed nearby. I wonder if, if Edie or uh, Judy have anything to add and also if you all would consider one more question. Yeah, go ahead Edie. Well, I, I really have nothing more to add. I think um, th this conversation has been, um, you know, really uh, sort of explained the challenges of um, communities that have been so reliant on one industry. And we're not just talking about uh, the fossil fuel industry. I mean, I lived in Alaska for 10 years. Um, I moved there uh, when the pipeline was just getting under construction and I left um, a few years after uh, it was complete and the way that it impacted communities uh, across the state was uh, tremendous. I mean, we went from a population of over half a million people to a quarter of a million people and um, communities that, you know, as Steve so well addressed, and so did Judy, 
uh, communities that had rec centers built and gymnasiums built and you know, uh, local arts programs funded, all of that came from these industries. Um, and then, you know, uh, the job was done and they left and it's pretty devastating. And um, back then there were no ways to pick up the pieces, people just left. And, uh, but Alaska is a boom and bust cycle economy anyway. Uh, some communities like Colorado are not and I think it's really commendable that all of us care so much about the impacts on the communities that have been dependent on uh, this, you know, these kinds of investments that the industries have made. And uh, so I, you know, I'm just going to identify that. And I think that's why we have an Office of Just Transition and it's bipartisan and the governor supports it and uh, the industry is working with us on that. So um, I just got to say that the renewable energy sector um, also has a lot of great jobs and great paying jobs. And so I think a bridge can be built there. Um, so I guess that's just what I'm going to add to the conversation. Did you all feel like you could take another question? Or are you ready to go? We're politicians. <laughs> I, I can do one more question, and then I gotta, I gotta do bedtime with the baby. And you're, and you're great politicians, and I don't want to cut in on story time. <laughs> this is a question that's really complicated and uh, would take forever to answer. But just to bring it up, um, is there any chance that we can change the way our utilities are, are how our regulated utilities operate? Can we uh, look at different kinds of financing and shifting uh, contracts, converting the PUC possibly to an independent system operator uh, or breaking up, uh, j just changing how our, our regulation would be working and uh, looking at as a public utility uh, rather than uh, that is working in the public interest rather than the profit making for stockholders? We should have quit while we were ahead. <laughs> uh, I, th I, I think I know who asked this question too. Um, and his name rhymes with Steve Pomerantz. Um, uh, I, so yes, the, the answer is, is exactly right. I mean, we have a systems problem when it comes to, to this issue. It's not just how do we get more solar on people's roofs and how do we buy some batteries? It's a, it's a systems problem and it's one that's been entrenched for um, for, you know, hundreds of years, essentially. Um, but, you know, the, it's hard to change systems fast. And, and I think, you know, it's a, a, a reasonable debate uh, out there on is, is it faster to change the system entirely or to work within the system um, to, to meet our climate uh, goals? And, and, and I think you could, very smart people could debate all night about which path is going to be more effective, and how are you going to get to the to the answer faster? Um, but I think it's a legitimate debate to be having. I'm glad we're having that debate. Um, as David said in the chat just now, performance based rate making is is a, is a possible you know path. Um, I'm guessing that doesn't um, uh, uh, quench Steve Pomerantz's thirst um, uh, on this issue, but we do uh, a level of performance rate. Um, performance-based rate making now, um, definitely not across the board. Um, but, but there's a lot of improvements we can make. And, and I think, Steve, your, your question is, is, is the right one to ask. Um, and, but but the, the, the deliberations are about sort of like, what's, what's going to get us to our goals the fastest? And I'm not necessarily saying I know the answer uh, uh, to it right now. Well, thank you all for being willing to add extra time in your busy day. And we really appreciate all of your answers and your work and your thought on our behalf. Thank you, everybody. This was just great. Yeah, yeah thank you for having us. And I think we all agree, Steve and Judy and I, what an incredible privilege it is 
to serve this community and the energy and the intellect and uh, the engagement and the support we get from you all um, to help us form our, our uh, policies and uh, within our legislation is, you know, we're, it's an embarrassment of riches. So just thank you so much. And keep reaching out to us. I know you will. Um, and I'm, I'll let Steve and Judy say a couple things, but it was a real honor and a pleasure to be here tonight with you. Yeah, I, I, I would just say the same as Edie. It's just great to have the support of so many people. And I, for myself, I know I have a lot to learn and I now know who I'm going to learn it from. And that's from you all. And um, so I'm all ears. If you want to contact me with your good ideas or if you're mad at me or if you're happy, um, please reach out. It's, um, it's my job to, to talk to you all and to learn from you. So thank you. Yeah, thank you all. Um, thanks, David. Thanks, Leslie. Thanks, everybody, for putting this together. Um, it, it's it's really fun to do a town hall where we can really kind of get into the weeds and not just um, brush on a, a handful of topics loosely. Um, the 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 crowd on this Zoom is super impressive. Obviously, tons of experts that we all know that are you know that we run into at the grocery store and whatever. And th these are our people in our community um, that know their stuff. I think the other awesome thing is that there actually are just perusing the participants list. There's a lot of people from the utility sector and from industry that are here that, um, and, and I think that that says a lot that that means, you know, they're not always going to be excited for all the things we've talked about on this, on the zoom tonight. But um, I, I think it is uh, 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 something to, to, to be proud of and to thank them for their willingness to be here. I know there are folks from Excel and Tri-State and, and Holy Cross and, and, um, yes, uh, uh, Brian, the people should visit the Holy Cross um, project in, in Basalt. It's super, super impressive. Um, and a really good example of what the future should look like um, and how we treat energy more as a service and less of a commodity. Um, so thank you for, for everyone who's joined tonight and for the expertise and the continued conversation. Thank you so much, um, you legislators. It's just awesome what you do. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Everybody's so grateful to you, and we're cheering you on and appreciate the incredible hard work you're going to be doing in this crazy session. So thank you. And, and wonderful answers, really inspiring, because they have such a vision of the future. And uh, for us to have legislators with that kind of vision and that kind of sensitivity is, is just a huge blessing. Thank you.